And then we changed the rules about costs in order to make it easier for the little man or woman, whether as claimant or as defendant, in like proceedings to be able to do a case. Because one of the great problems we had is that only the very rich could afford either to bring libel cases uh, or, or to defend them. Uh, and, and the bill itself has now been enacted and it will come into force by the end of the year and it is a complete transformation of the way we have balanced free speech uh, and, and reputation uh, in the way that I've tried to describe. Again, we in the rest of the world simply can't understand how you can have a system in which free speech trumps personal privacy, even in the Brezkine situation which occurred uh, in, in, the, in the time uh, in the case. So we regard your libel law as crafted by the Supreme Court uh, as unbalanced and trade unions with the consequences you all see in, in your elections. But then there's the, the Holder and Humanitarian Law Project. Again, useless to victims of seriously harmful libels and of denied constitutional protection to the victims of gross media intrusion on private lives. They made it impossible for the states to rebalance their libel laws that we have done they removed restrictions on campaign spending designed to promote a level playing field while permitting sweeping restrictions on free speech in the context of national security. That's why I, like most in the older world, can give only two cheers to the First Amendment as currently interpreted. My old friend and colleague Floyd Abrams would not agree, preferring the near absolutism of Hugo Black's reading of First Amendment to ours, but I remind myself of Learned Hand's famous speech on the spirit of liberty given in 1944 in Central Park, New York. The spirit of liberty, he declared, is the spirit that is not too sure that it is right. And surely that is also the spirit which should inform the way the First Amendment is given effect. Thank you for listening. I mean, it's like Julian Assange, the same kind of issue. The, um, when a public official um, who has duties of loyalty uh, to those who, for whom he works um, betrays that duty um, as a whistleblower uh, because he says it's in the public interest to do so, then there must be a whistleblower's defense. The question in each case is whether, on the fact of the case, the extent of the disclosure is really justified or not. Uh, in the WikiLeaks case, although I'm not an expert on the detail, it seems to me that the release of the information is quite indiscriminate, uh, and therefore, I would say, not justifiable. Uh, I don't know really enough about the Snowden uh, uh, stuff on the facts to, to be able to tell but it's a really difficult balance. We had it in, in, in the spy catcher case, which I once argued in Britain, on a smaller scale, when um, Peter Wright wrote a book alleging that the security service were plotting to depose our Prime Minister Wilson. Uh, and the book we bought here, it was banned in Britain, it was very bad law, we had to go to Europe and so on. Now that was a case where it was clear that the, that the disclosures of information by the press or in the public interest. In the public interest defense we've written into the Defamation Act, provided that you can show objectively that the disclosure is in the public interest, you can have a complete defense. Were not about libel at all, they were about privacy. They were about illegal criminal acts of telephone hacking, tapping, and so on. Uh, um, that's why it's particularly deplorable for those who wanted to punish the press to do so by tacking it onto a, to a libel bill. So I don't think that the libel bill would have um, any real effect on that. And it's fair to say that all the journalists who were engaged 
in criminal activity or tortious activity have either been prosecuted um, or sued for compensation. So we have quite enough law in my view. And I'm not in favour of either state regulation nor a newfangled privacy law when we already have quite enough in Britain to cope with.